There was a time when I worried about having our finger in so many pies and being spread out too thin. And then there was a time when I came to realize that's none of my business. God will <laughs> get us involved in what he wants us to get us involved in. And, uh, and ever since then, I've had less stress. <laughs> in February of 2008, Major Phil Packer was struck by a rocket blast while serving with the British Armed Forces in Basra, Iraq. This is a picture of him. He suffered major heart and spinal injuries, enough that medics told the now paraplegic soldier that he would never walk again. But as you can tell from the picture, they were wrong by a whopping 26.2 miles. Because in the summer of 2009, Major Packer completed his first steps. And not only completed his first steps and finished his therapy, he completed in the Flora London Marathon on crutches only one month after one year of rehabilitation. Starting the marathon with the main race group, he finished 13 days later. He covered roughly two miles a day, and the whole journey took him 52,400 steps. When you're told you'll never walk again, every step is worth counting. And when each race day consists of 4,000 painful steps, you probably count each limp and remember every one of them. I tell you this story by way of introduction because in many ways, Major Packer's story is our story. There were many predictions, not, not just of our paralysis, but of our impending death. I recall uh, back in the mid-70s, uh, one uh, counter-cult ministry uh, run by a fellow named Joseph Hopkins, he said that once Herbert Armstrong died, our church would disintegrate. And he said that it would disintegrate by splintering, splitting and splitting repeatedly until it split into oblivion and disintegrated and come, had no existence. But going on in time, when my dad died, similar sentiments were expressed by those people leading the groups that splintered from us. And apparently, Jesus had other plans. I'm reminded of Mark Twain saying that after someone mistakenly reported his obituary in a newspaper, he said the reports of my death are, have been exaggerated sort of implies to us. For Major Packer, as he entered this marathon race, he knew that he would be limping a lot during his 26-mile journey. And limping for him, if I could use the poker term, was being all in. Uh, he didn't hedge his bets. Uh, he didn't hold anything back. He was all in. And as he participated in this marathon, he didn't quit along the way. He finished the run 13 days later, limping towards his goal. Now, what's fascinating was this began to uh, become an item in the press, and people would join him in this journey as he was completing the 26-mile marathon. Families of lost soldiers would join him. Uh, police, firefighters would join him, even a few politicians. Sometimes whole classrooms from elementary school would run along with him the two miles he ran that day, each day. Now, in our fellowship, we are a people called by God, and he's called us to join in his run, in his dance, as we were just singing about. And it's a mission that we collectively participate doing with Jesus. And I do believe that most of you, if not all, every single one of you, has a good hold on the vision and the mission that God has given to us. And you may not be able to articulate it in precise words, uh, but I know that you hold the vision dearly to your hearts. And I say that because of another cliche. People put their money where their mouth is. And as I try to illustrate on the next slide, this is the uh, average donations over the last five years. And as you can see, 
they go up a little bit and down a little bit. And um, last year they were up a bit, which is a remarkable thing considering the economy. And so I thank you for your part in those donations for, as I, if I can use that cliche again, for putting your money where your mouth is. Now many of our pastors and members have been doing this and, and I want to talk about our vision and our mission and if I, will, if I can illustrate some things for you in this presentation. And one of the things I want to do is play a couple of video clips. This will be the first one. We're on a mission from God. Ma'am, you've got to understand that this is a lot bigger than any domestic problems you might be experiencing. Would it make you feel any better if you knew that what we're asking Matthew to do is a holy thing? You see, we're on a mission from God. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Yep. I'm glad you enjoy that humor. And your laughter s implies that you've seen the movie. <laughs> and your laughter just confirmed it for me. Comic relief is a part of the method of my madness because I've read uh, a couple of studies that laughter helps us remember better. And it also lowers blood pressure. It also increases vascular blood flow that helps oxygenate your brain. And that's good. Gives a little bit of a workout to the diaphragm. It uh, reduces your stress because it, uh, hormones such as cortisol and adrenaline are released in little bursts while you laugh. It also increases the response of your tumor and disease killing cells. See, laughter is the best medicine. It helps you fight off respiratory infections, even reduces the frequency of colds. So laughing is good, and I hope I make you laugh a few more times since it seems like I'm doing something medicinal here. <laughs> John Hopkins University Medical School is the one that did the study that showed that laughter helps increase your memory and your learning, and that it leads to increased test scores for those taking classes. It improves your alertness, your creativity, your memory, and most important, males perform better on tests when laughter was involved in learning. And I really want men to learn. <laughs> That's because women catch on faster. Right? <laughs> now, these last few conferences that we've had, I've given some statistics on our growth, on our change. I've shown pictures of church members and ministers from around the world, and pictures of new congregations. And in the last round of conferences, I went around asking people uh, what they liked about the conferences, what they liked about my presentation, because I was seeking feedback on my presentation. And consistently, I was told these three things. People want to continue to hear more stories about our churches and members and ministries around the world uh, because they're exciting and encouraging to hear. They're inspiring. And so I promise I will give you more today. Uh, I was told a lot that the video clips are great. Uh, everyone enjoys a little comic relief. So I will have two more video clips. And from time to time, I deconstruct Armstrongism. And I've been told people really enjoy that, too. I won't do that quite as overtly, but it's happening in my presentation. <laughs> and. Uh, and I'll show you some of our later, latest worldwide developments, so I hope to do all three of those today. And since we have churches in a hundred countries now, uh, I don't want you to think that because I'm showing places from all over the world that somehow nothing is happening in the U.S. Oh, contraire, many things good and wonderful are happening in the U.S. But I don't want to make this a U U.S you know, a heavily weighted presentation. I want to show you what we're doing as we participate with what Jesus is doing around the world. So don't uh, come to the false conclusion that nothing's happening in the U.S. But first I want to draw 
our attention to our mission and vision statements and even talk about what is the difference between a mission and a vision, organizational theories draw a, a big distinction uh, between vision and mission. Vision is what the future of your organization looks like because you're doing the mission so exceedingly well. And our mission is what we do every day. So vision creates a momentum of growing anticipation about your future that becomes realized as you do the mission on a daily basis. Mission is what we work at, so I want to look at it first. So all together, say out loud, what's our mission statement? Yeah, I, hear some, I hear some good statements. I, 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 I didn't expect in unison you all to say the same thing. And that's okay. Um, and I know that you embrace our mission because of all the good things that are happening as well as putting your money where your mouth is. But our mission statement is we are committed to living and sharing the good news of what God has done through Jesus Christ. That's our mission statement on our website. But because you don't always remember that, that sounds a bit academic or pedantic, if you will. We, we put it in easier words, living and sharing the gospel. That's our mission statement. From my perspective, we're fulfilling that mission, and I just see wonderful things happening all over the world. And I came across this living and sharing the gospel is, you know, letting God's love flow through you and not being a short stop or putting a container, uh, uh, something to stop it and contain it, you know, like you put a cork in a bottle, but letting it flow. I love the sound when you open, you know, a liquid and it goes glug, 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 flows out. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear God's love flowing out of the bottle, that we're not trying to stop it up and keep it from flowing. But I came across this interesting bit where some social scientists interviewed some young kids. These are, you know, kids that were, oh, like second and third graders and even lower, younger. Uh, and they wanted to see how these kids understood the meaning of love. And so they asked him, what does love mean? And these kids gave uh, some pretty profound statements about what love is. Listen to this. One kid said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't reach her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That is love. So that was interesting that a child could conceptualize that love in action and express it that way. Another child said, love is that first feeling you feel before all the bad stuff gets in the way. <laughs> huh. This next one, love is when someone hurts you and you get so mad, but you don't yell at them because you know it will hurt their feelings. Next one, love is what makes you smile when you are tired. I identify to that one. Next one is, when you tell someone something bad about yourself and you're scared they won't love you anymore, but then you get surprised because they still love and tell you that they love you even more. Now, who would have expected uh, such profundity from little kids? I've got uh, two more. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. <laughs> and the last one. Love is when you go out and eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you anything of theirs. <laughs> Kids nailed it, huh? There are two kinds of love, our love and God's love, and God made both kinds of them. Jesus told us that by this shall all men know you are my disciples for your love for one another. So I could equally say 
living and sharing the gospel or go out there and give away your french fries. <laughs> That's been my mission uh, since our split and, and I got the uh, role of being the president is to point people to Jesus, and it appears to me that that's your vision too. So that's our collective vision, and it doesn't trouble me if you say some, some other words. At least you know what the mission is, living and sharing the gospel. And people understand this at their own pace, in their own way. And there's another wonderful video clip from the same movie, that illustrates that. My hope and prayer is that you can clearly see the light about this mission God has called all of us to do. And it's one of those things there, you can dance if you want to. Um, but I would hasten to add that some people have more energy, more athleticism. <laughs> I, I, I'm past the time when I can do the somersault or the... <laughs> And my flip was never quite as good as John Belushi's. And one of the things I enjoy doing now at my age at life is I like watching other people dance. It's really humorous because some people think they really can dance. <laughs> and what I see is people dancing, but they're not dancing with Jesus. <laughs> they're doing their own kind of jig. But it's, it's funny. And if you're at the age that I'm at, or even worse, if your dance is not worth watching, you can still sway with the music. And to illustrate what I mean that some people just don't dance well, there's another video clip. Come on, who's dancing? You want me to, you want me to get it started? I'll get it started. <laughs> I submit to you that when you're dancing with, with God, other people are drawn into the dance. As you notice in this clip, nobody else wanted to dance. In fact, George Costanza starts invoking Moses. So let's talk about vision. All together in unison, what's our vision? No, but you're listening and remembering. Maybe I said mission instead of vision. Our mission is living and sharing the gospel. Our vision is Grace Communion International exists to help each congregation of Grace Communion International attain its God-given potential. So, of course, we framed it in better terms all kinds of churches for all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And you'll find that on our website. That is our vision statement. Remember, this is the long-term view. It's the compelling vision that if we do the mission every day, living and sharing the gospel, we realize the vision. Right? So that's the difference between the vision and mission. You see them. It really doesn't matter if you can articulate them well as long as you continue to put your money where your mouth is and live and share the gospel. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to see that in action as I will show you as we move forward. And it's important that we realize that we are all called to the same calling to live and share the gospel. I view the vision and the mission statements as what we are 
and what we are doing. Our, if I could put it this way, our being and our doing. And you know you should not separate your being from your doing. And while I cannot cast a specific vision for your local congregation, for your local outreach ministry, I can articulate what we must all participate in doing, living and sharing the gospel, not separating our being from our doing. God uses all of us to complete this mission, but we focus our efforts and our resources into developing dynamic, healthy local churches, doing ministry. We're a growing, loving community of people dynamically living God's mission in this world. And we are growing in a community of practice as we do that. Now, God works his calling in everyone's life in different and varied ways. You know, I'm, uh, I didn't experience what Paul did and, you know, be <laughs> suddenly in a vision, why are you persecuting me, Paul? <laughs> God, through his spirit, works with us he knows our temperament, he knows our moods, he knows our personalities. It's not one size fits all. He's working with us, he's doing something. And when you realize that, and you embrace that, then you wanna participate in what Jesus is doing. And if you're not participating in what Jesus is doing, then we're doing our own thing in ministry. And when you do your own thing in ministry, be aware that is the quickest path to burnout. Because we cannot do God's work in our own power. You just can't do it. It'll wear you out, it'll grind you into nothing. Because we can't do God's work in our power. We should never view ourselves apart from Christ because if we do that, that's not who we are. We are one with him in his glorified humanity. When he ascended, he took us with him. And if you're doing God's work in your own power, this is how I would illustrate it. If I was a better artist, I would add a picture of Jesus sitting in the wagon. Can't do God's work in our own power, it burns people out. You know, in the past, we had what is referred to as a totally institutional view. We saw the church as a destination. We had programs that people consumed. <laughs> but we're not a machine. The church is not a machine with disposable parts. It's, it's not something to be micromanaged. And so we've moved from this totally institutional perspective to a totally missional perspective. Instead of the church being a destination, it's part of the body released into the world. Instead of it having programs to consume, we live out the gospel for others to see. Instead of being a machine with disposable parts, we're an organism. And all are vital in the organism. God loves us all. Instead of a micromanaged affair, we're people empowering and engaged in a releasing process. This is the transition we've made over the last decade. When we continue in the present ministry of Jesus, we must bear in mind that, it, it, that that's not something that we should lose. We don't want to be cast back upon our own resources and do things in our own power. It's, it's just not going to work. We've tried that for years and years, and it didn't work. The heart of the gospel is Jesus. And I love a phrase that uh, I first heard Gary Detto use, he said, Jesus is the center of the center. And immediately it came into my mind was a Tootsie Roll Pop. Because when I was a kid, I'd get the Tootsie Roll Pop. And the thing I wanted most was to get through that candy shell and get to the good stuff inside. Jesus is the center of the center. So what and who is the basis of our ministry? Well, Jesus is the basis of our ministry. His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. What we want to communicate to people is the real thing, the perfect love of Jesus. The relationship of love that we see in the life of the Trinity isn't something that you can imitate. Uh, 
In fact, I believe it's impossible to imitate. My wife likes skim milk. And when I go to the store to buy milk, Tammy reminds me every time, okay, get the 1% milk. Because I've made mistakes and brought home the 2%. <laughs> like, you know, the 1% is going to make that big a difference. She was not happy with that. Of course, there were times when I brought home half and half. <laughs> I really liked that. She didn't like that at all. And so I've, I tried to reason with her. Well, we buy both now, 1% and the half and half. But in trying to reason with her, I said, well, you know, don't you prefer real butter? And of course she does. My, my wife's a popcorn fiend, and she loves to melt real butter on the popcorn. Not this imitation butter, margarine, which is literally one molecule away from being plastic. <laughs> I don't want that on my popcorn. I don't want that on my anything. <laughs> I don't want the skim milk. I don't want the imitation fake butter. I, I want the real, genuine item. And it's the same way with love. How many of you want fake love? You want the real thing, don't you? So when it comes to love, you want the authentic, you want the real thing. And our collective vision is not a business model. I mean, we, we don't do church to make money. And it isn't an academic model either. And it isn't a cliche. Since I've been in this administration, oh my goodness, since 1995 now, I've been sometimes asked, what is the vision for the church? And one of the things about getting older is that experience tells you to slow down and enjoy the ride. And I've long ago learned I don't sit in the judgment seat of God. Uh, God's able to direct things without my kibitzing. He's able to handle it. And I rely on that. Because if this church and our direction and everything that's taking place around the world depended on me, it would have long ago ceased to exist. So my vision is to look forward and see where God is leading us, try to articulate that as best I can. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last decade. Of course, we make plans the best we can. We try to prepare for the unexpected as much as we can. But in today's uncertain economy, the best way I can articulate what my strategy is, is to be more like a fire department. To be ready for whatever job is here and go to it and do it. And I can't put out all the fires myself, and so you are the fire department along with me. And while I'm putting out some fires here, you're putting out some fires there. And uh, just let that love flow. Live and share the gospel. I believe Grace Community International does have a future, even if I don't know the smallest details. I sometimes wonder if the Apostle Paul would have gone all the places he went to if he'd have known that he was going to be shipwrecked on this trip, if he'd have known he was going to be beaten 40 save one on that trip, if he'd have known all the things that were going to happen to him on each one of these trips, I wonder if he would go. You know, when I fly, I fly 100,000 miles a year, going to different conferences with our ministers around the world. If I knew that the plane was going to crash on one of the trips, I probably would skip it. <laughs> I'm not going to know all the details, so I'm always slightly amused by the questions that I get sometimes. Joe, where do you see us in five years or ten years? I say, well, I'll be here watching with you. It's like that old analogy on the, the tandem bicycle. Long ago, I got uh, <laughs> off the front seat steering the thing and got on the back seat. Let Jesus steer it, and I'll just pedal and enjoy the scenery with him. And sometimes the scenery is exhilarating. Sometimes we're going up and down way faster than I want to go. <laughs> but I'm hanging on and pedaling because that's what he's called me to do, and that's what he's called you to do. And looking back, especially over the last 15 years, I can't claim any credit for what's happened. I really wouldn't try. We're in it together, and I would not rather be in it with any other people than you all. So I appreciate that. And let me add, 
We are not too old to be or to do. I don't expect older people to do what young ones can by virtue of their health and their energy, but we do not view an older man or an older woman, I don't view them as a spent force. I encourage our aging folks, our aging ministry and members to not give up, just give differently. In fact, I've read some interesting studies last year that uh, elderly have a slower response time when they're forced to make a decision because they don't want to make a mistake. It has nothing to do really with you're older and think slower. The fact of it is that you don't want to make a mistake. And if you don't want to make a mistake, that's a good reason to take it a little bit slower. As one uh, psychologist at Ohio State who did the study said, many people think that it's just natural for older people's brains to slow down as they age. But we're finding that isn't true, said Roger Ratcliffe, professor of psychology at Ohio State University, co-author of the study. In some situations, 70-year-olds may have response times similar to those of 25-year-olds. Well, there you go. You can dance, just not as energetically. Now, Mark Twain is famous for another quote besides his premature death. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> and for the sake of accuracy, I want to tell you that is attributed to Mark Twain, but he's, he copied it from a Benjamin Disraeli. He's not the one who came up with it. So in the remainder of time, I will avoid all three of those kinds of lies. You remember the Morlung Church, formerly known as the Church Under the Tree? Last year I gave you an update and showed you the big tree they meet under. Well, they now have a church in a tent. The tent is because, and here's a picture of the pastor that Timur McGuire ordained, Sali Talali. Remember I mentioned his colorful name? And this is a picture, of course, inside the tent that was donated by two of the Canadian churches. They uh, they bought this tent and shipped it over, and they set up the tent so they can meet in the tent out of the sun beating down on them. And the tree is still there, and it's the parking lot. Bicycles and occasionally an automobile is parked under there. Uh, but one of the members, he planted a church up there and now has, I don't know, 35 or so attending. and. The latest development is at the Moreland Church site where they had the tent, one of the members donated this piece of land and the youth group in the church are making bricks and they're building their own church building. And the tent is going up to the new church plant 40 kilometers north. I just think that's way cool and thought you'd enjoy hearing there's more to that story of the church under the tree. Another interesting development that took place, and uh, this time I'll go from Africa to Alberta in Canada. We had uh, a couple of members who moved from the Philippines to Westlock. Alberta is the Texas of Canada, for those who are not aware of that. Uh, that's where a lot of the rich oil fields are, and a lot of Canadians have moved to Alberta to work in those oil fields or related industries. And uh, it's kind of like it was in the 50s and 60s in Texas, and uh, a lot of people, a lot of money in Alberta. So some of the Filipinos are, have moved there, relocated there, and a couple of our people did. And you know, it's just in the DNA of our uh, Philippine membership, they planted a church. And so <laughs> Bob, um, Bob Millman, our pastor in Edmonton, now has a satellite church that he oversees that the Filipino folks have planted. And here's a picture of them uh, after a church service. And this uh, started on, in January of this year. And they now have 70 people in attendance. Okay, now I'll take you to Papua New Guinea. Uh, I don't know how much you know about New Guinea, but uh, it's a dangerous place and a difficult place. It's uh, politically very, uh, well, not stable. 
we have uh, four churches in Papua New Guinea. And let me show, this is a picture of uh, two of our uh, elders. The picture on your left shows the two elders. The picture on the right is one of the elders with his wife. Um, ben and Richard are the names of the two elders, and that's Ben and his wife Maria in the other picture. And they have some outreach ministries. Uh, some of our uh, professional folks, as well as people that are uh, recruited to, for service, uh, go to these remote places and do medical kinds of uh, uh, clinics for people. And uh, this, is, this is pictures that were taken during those kinds of things. Uh, one of the most remarkable stories about our church that I have to take time, even if I go over time, to tell you is that Ben and Richard are from two different tribes. And there was an accident that took place involving too much alcohol and, and machinery and cars and such. I know when the details are a bit sketchy, but one member died of one tribe, and a member of the other tribe was somewhat responsible. And this was putting the, the tribal tensions at the highest level. And the usual way for these tribes to deal with these things was to kill someone from the neighboring tribe. Well, since Ben is from the, uh, the tribe where the person died and, and uh, Richard's from the tribe uh, from the offending party, the two elders got together and, and negotiated the peace and brought about a reconciliation. And it, uh, to me, it's just a, a, an outrageously cool thing to happen that two of our elders would negotiate a peace between two tribes that are ready to go to war. That is participating in what Jesus is doing. And not just there, let me take you to India real quickly. This is a relatively new member of our church, Dr. Santharam. Uh, he is a retired professor of radiology. And he, he joined our church over a year ago. And he's no stranger to tragedy because his first wife and only child, a daughter, died in an automobile wreck. And when he retired, he, he wanted to reach out to people who have such a thing happen to them, people who are left orphaned or people who are left alone. And so he started his own orphanage, and eventually he remarried. And here's a picture of the good doctor who's now 70 years old. And with his uh, new wife, they, they sponsor uh, a, an orphanage that takes care of 35 children. And uh, here's a picture of the property where the orphanage is. Uh, here is a picture of 28 of the children of the 35 that live in the orphanage. As his, his outreach ministry grew and these buildings went up, the India did start to take notice and impose uh, some of their building codes upon him and some restrictions upon him. So it forced him to build a dormitory. And this is a picture of the dormitory. Uh, this is the former kitchen. And there was a cobra that took up residence in the kitchen. And now they don't use that kitchen anymore. <laughs> I'm told no one goes in there, which forced them to build this new kitchen. <laughs> and here's a picture of the shower facilities, restroom facilities. Uh, to give you a little bit of a, <coughs> excuse me, an insight into the hearts of Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Santharam, they took responsibility for this little fellow named Sibila. Uh, he's 12 years old and he was uh, a physically, severely physically disabled, mentally disabled boy. And he was just abandoned, left to die. And so they took him in because they just couldn't allow that to happen. Uh, let me take you to Honduras. We have a church in Tegucigalpa of 75 people in attendance. And uh, they started a youth camp. And they had 35 at their first camp, uh, which is a wonderful thing. I visited there probably three or four years ago. And they were just starting their church plant. And you might recall I showed you a picture uh, of, well, I can't see him without my glasses on from here, <laughs> but I showed you a picture of the pastor, and he's a retired elementary school teacher, 
and he was all excited. He told me that I've, always, I've wanted to plant a church, I've looked forward to this time of retirement, and now I can have relationships with adults because <laughs> I've talked to children my whole life. And the first day after he advertised uh, that he was planting a church, all children came. <laughs> no adults came. But as time went on and the kids kept coming, because he was a favored teacher, some of the parents decided, I wonder what goes on there. And the parents started coming uh, to the church service and some stayed. And the church has grown and now they have just planted another church uh, in the local jail. And they've had six baptisms this year and they have an attendance of 35 people in the local jail for their church. Another interesting story, uh, you know, we have quite a few uh, churches that have grown up as refugee churches in Africa. You know, in Africa, it seems like the countries on that continent rotate. I don't know if they roll the dice or spin a spinner and then it's this country's turn for their civil war and it, it just, in Africa, at any one time, there's one or two countries experiencing civil war. And one of, the, you know, one of the places where a lot of people used to flee was to Kenya. And we had a few refugee churches in Kenya. And people who went back home sometimes planted churches. Uh, and so we kind of grew by word of mouth and through these refugees relocating, which is, is a neat thing. But there is an international program where you sign up if you've been a refugee for a certain number of years and you're, you're picked. Some, they pick a number of people every year and they relocate them to a country and buy them a house and get them a job. And we had this happen twice in this last year to, to uh, members in our church who were formerly refugees in Africa. Uh, this this uh, particular picture here is of Komoti Matendo and his family uh, came from Ethiopia and that's where they're originally from. I don't remember where they were in Kenya, but they got selected by the UN to participate in this relocation program and I mean it's, it's the equivalent of, of winning the million dollar lottery. They got to go, they all, their whole family was relocated. They were given a house and a job. Now, what do you think the first thing they did was when they got there? Well, they started reaching out to find other people uh, who they could relate to, who would come from Africa, specifically Ethiopia, because that's where they were from originally. And they found nine other families, and they planted a church. And they, uh, they did that on the 18th of March of this year. And the place they were relocated to is in Holland. And that didn't just happen once, it's happened twice this year, which I think is neat. This, I'll take you to Trinidad. You might recall last year I told you the story about our pastor and his wife in Trinidad, Clifton and Pearl Charles, who uh, started a prison ministry, both in the men's prison and the women's prison. And, how they now have churches operating in both prisons. Uh, well, one of their members wasn't keen on working in prisons, but she wanted to do something, and her expertise was in uh, teaching uh, better language skills. And so she got involved in uh, a literacy program, and she has several students, a few of which now have come to church. I mentioned that this thing happened twice with the United Nations selecting someone to be relocated. It happened again and this, this family went from Malawi to uh, Queensland. And Goodna is a uh, suburb of Brisbane, Australia. And this is a rather large family. The, the Nunda family has 24 adults and children. I don't know the breakdown of how many adults and how many children it is, but 24, uh, that's a big family. In fact, that's a church. <laughs> <laughs> and the UN, of course, relocated them and gave them two houses because 
that many people don't fit in one house. And again, in the DNA of some of our people, because they speak Swahili, they started looking for people that speak Swahili. They found some, and now Bob Regazzoli, our pastor in Brisbane, helps oversee Jeff, Jafari Nunda's church plant. And I think last year I mentioned that in Bulgaria, we have a church member who uh, years ago was ordained a deacon. He has a house church and he has as many as 12 to 15 meeting in his house. Uh, remember our vision, all kinds of churches for all kinds of people in all kinds of places. Well, his church service is a bit different. Uh, m many of them play guitars and he doesn't give very long sermons. He gives kind of a testimonial or a good story that lasts no more than 10 or 12 minutes. And then most of their worship is singing songs. And they took on an orphanage that they sponsor as an outreach ministry. And then they took on a second orphanage. And they don't do this all on their own. They're receiving help from some of our Dutch churches and our German churches to support them in this effort. Well, they took on a third orphanage. And it's a, the one on the, it's the Kerman one is the new one. And Jambal is the old one. And there are 78 children in the Kerman uh, orphanage that they're overseeing. 20 of those children are seriously ill and bedridden. But uh, it's just amazing that we're involved in so many things in so many places. Let me quickly take you to Bogota, Colombia. Uh, Bogota is where Hector Barrero pastors. Their church building seats 150, and they've been at 150 for a year or so, and he decided it's time to open up and uh, start a second church service. And one of the things they do as an outreach ministry is teaching marriage enhancement classes. And his church used to be half the size. His church doubled in size through these marriage enhancement outreach ministry. So he continues to do that. And so he advertised that he was gonna have a, another class and have a second church service and 40 people registered to take the class. So he's starting with 40 people in his new service, which uh, that's a pretty nice way to start. Quickly, I'll take you to Bangladesh. Uh, we have uh, 14 permanent congregations now in Bangladesh and another four seasonal congregations that meet um, there when there's not a typhoon or monsoon or all those nasty words that mean calamity. And these are pictures of the recent outreach event that took place here just a few months ago. Uh, it was our first GCI conference uh, in Bangladesh, and there were over 2,000 in attendance. And the more remarkable thing about that is that this was a mixture of not only our 14 congregations, but there were Muslims there and there were Hindus there. And John Biswa, who's our pastor overseeing these churches, said the most amazing thing was one of the most active guys at the conference was a Muslim who volunteered to hand out Bibles to people. <laughs> so I think Jesus is doing something there. And this is a picture of their latest church building. Uh, Actually, it looks much, much nicer than that. It's been painted, off, and uh, in, this was the last picture I received before it was painted. And this is a, a picture uh, next to it of his graduation class for the School of Nursing that they, that they sponsor. Uh, quickly, I'll take you to Peru. Um, La Huaca is uh, in the north part of Peru. And we have Juan, Juan Carlos is, uh, He's not just a farmer, uh, he's gained some education in the use of fertilizers and such, and he's become the, the resident expert on, on farming and agricultural products to use. And all the farmers, he's the most successful farmer in the area, and all the other farmers consult with him if, if they want to be successful. Well, he's a good soul, and he planted a little church, and that's their church building as you can see in the picture here. And I, in the next slide, I have pictures of some of the members. I say it's a small church. Uh, their attendance ranges between 25 and 30 people. And Juan Carlos Florian is 
Um, he, he's just a, a very talented fellow. And when he wants to hold an event, everybody comes. All the farmers come. They all bring his family. He just uh, naively commands that kind of respect. People, when he's going to do something, people want to come and be part of it. Uh, let me show you the Solomon Islands. We do have a church there. The, the fella in the middle is Derek Alawan, and uh, he sent me some pictures. Uh, they, they, held, they held a um, national day of prayer in the Solomon Islands, so he was very pleased with their event, and in conjunction with that, they did a blessing of the children's ceremony, and so they got a lot of visitors bringing their little kids to church to receive a blessing. And he sent me pictures of their church building. Um, this is looking out the window of the church. This is a picture of his house. And uh, I've never been here, so I do, it's on my bucket list to visit Derek uh, before I die and get to the Solomon Islands. But it's quite an arduous journey. It's not an easy place to get to. It's a 60-minute flight from the capital city, then a 90-minute ride by canoe or an outboard motor to the island of Renonga, where the church is. So it's just not an easy place to get to, but, uh, but he, did, he wanted to be known that he is an active minister in Grace Communion International, and they're getting new members too. And he'll be encouraged when I tell him I showed this slide all over the US. And the last but not least, I'll take you to Incar Invercargill is the southernmost congregation we have in the world at the very southern end of the South Island of New Zealand. And uh, this is an outreach ministry that Les and Kay Evans do. Uh, it's kind of like a, what the Salvation Army does. Uh, they, they have a second hand kind of a good store, and it's very successful. Here's pictures inside uh, what it looks like, uh, and this, this has a citywide reputation, so it does attract visitors to the congregation all the time, and it, by word of mouth, our, our church has such a wonderful reputation there for helping people. He even put in recently this, uh, one of these jumping jungle, jungle, gin, whatever they are. He's got one of those. And in the U.S., one of the neat things we have is a, a brand spanking new church plant that's taking place. The name of the church will be Hands for Christ Community Church. And the reason it's called Hands for Christ, of course, you would well understand. It's a church for deaf and hearing impaired, and everything's done in sign language. So Hands for Christ. I like the name. And it's uh, being planted by a fairly newly ordained elder, Mary Batchelor, for some of you who may... I see some smiling faces, you, you know her. So I move to the conclusion. I wish that I had time to tell you about the new congregations in Uganda and Zambia and Liberia and, and the newest developments in China and the Philippines, but I don't. Uh, I'm already 15 minutes over time and I hate setting such a bad example of going <laughs> over time. I, I will stop and tell you one more story about a good pastor friend of mine, Tim Sitterly, who pastors our congregation in the Northwest, and he holds an annual outreach event at which he, he has different themes each year, and uh, this year it's going to be a Greek theme, and I guess they're going to pretend that they're in Athens. Uh, last year they were south of the border and he mixed margaritas. So it's quite an outreach event. And Tim... Tim's a good old boy. I don't know what he's doing in the Northwest. But anyway, Tim went to the liquor store, and he's wearing his shirt you know, with his Grace Communion on it. And he's got a grocery cart full of tequila and margarita mix. And the cart's full. I'm not talking, you know, for like for two families coming over. I mean, he, he says five, 600 people are going to come. I'm going to have enough vodka and... I'm sorry, uh, tequila and uh, margarita mix for everyone to have a margarita. And so as he pulls up to illustrate him living and sharing the gospel, <laughs> it was a slow time of day and there are a couple people behind the counter in the cash, re cash register. 
and Pastor Tim says, uh, can I get a 10% discount for being a, a church it, it, <laughs> buying this nice liquor? <laughs> Which put the three people behind the counter in slack-jawed amazement. <laughs> One of which was the manager. <laughs> and the lady spoke up and said, well, what does your pastor think of this? And he said, I'm the pastor. <laughs> and she said, so your church thinks that drinking is okay? He says, well, of course, but in moderation. <laughs> the lady said, well, that's a church I want to find out about. <laughs> and she's been attending ever since. So I, I, I teased Tim about that. I, I call it margarita evangelism. <laughs> I have some more stories like that, but I just, we're out of time. But after Major Packer completed that 26.2 mile marathon run, he decided to take on another challenge. He took on Yosemite's infamous El Capitan, which for those of you who know about such things, it's rated as America's hardest mountain to scale. And he accomplished it in a four-day summit, entirely by his upper body strength. Pretty remarkable thing. He, in his training regiment, got up to 4,000 pull-ups a day. When we co-minister with Jesus, we're in the same pattern of this training regimen because we rely on upper body strength. That is the strength that comes from up above. We move forward in prayerfulness. Prayer is our pull-ups. And we are grounded in Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. And we're summoned to believe in that way and have faith in the one who is faithful. Join me in a concluding prayer. Our very loving Father, we're so grateful to you. Words fail us uh, to even articulate uh, our appreciation for what you're doing, so all we can say is just thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for how you are moving in everyone's lives around this earth. And thank you for giving us the eyes and the vision to see it more clearly. What we ask, Father, is that your Holy Spirit continue to lead us to continue to give us vision, a more acute vision, to be able to be more sensitive to his lead, to be able to see more clearly how and where Jesus is working and how we can join in. I thank you for everyone here and for how they have over the years uh, been faithful too. So we pray that your spirit guide us and nourish us uh, through the remainder of this conference. In Jesus' name, amen.